व्यापकाय च धर्म सेधर्मस्वूपिने अवतारवरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णा ते नम I bow down with reverence to Sri Ram Krishna, the establisher of righteousness, the essence of all religions, and the greatest of all divine incarnations. In a second, I'm going to discuss this opening mantra uh, a little bit more closely. But before I do that, my humble pranams to Revered Dhyana Yogananda Ji Maharaj and Revered Paramahansa Ji Maharaj, and my namaskars to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. I look forward to meeting you, and uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, as Dhyana Yogananda mentioned, uh, he's known me since my day of joining. I, I I was the first Brahmachari to join at Vivekananda University long back in 2010, and he was there and he really supported me. He was the only other Westerner there, and uh, there's inevitably some culture shock when you first move to India from the West, and so he helped me kind of get over some stumbles and. So I appreciate it. It's so wonderful to be here, and um, it's it's wonderful to see Trabuco Canyon thriving under his leadership, and the help of other monastics here. So, as I promised, I wanted to start with uh, one really striking phrase in this opening mantra: "Avatara Varishta." You know, our tradition is well known for being extremely broad and typically avoiding this kind of language of saying our avatara is greater than yours and this kind of why does why does swami vekananda this mantra was composed by swami vekananda himself about his guru shri ram krishna why does he call shri ram krishna avatara varishta the greatest of all avataras in what sense i've often thought about this um so what i've done is i've i've looked to some of his writings to gain some insight into that so i wanted to read to you a passage from an 1894 letter to his brother disciple swami ramakrishnananda he said my dear brother that ramakrishna paramahamsa was god incarnate i have not the least doubt his life is a searchlight of infinite power thrown upon the whole mass of indian religious thought he was a living commentary to the vedas and to their aim He had lived in one life the whole cycle of the national religious existence in India. Whether Bhagavan Sri Krishna was born at all we are not sure. And avatars like Buddha and Chaitanya are monotonous. The it was writ, written in Bangla originally and so the word for monotonous is agghe in Bangla. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa is the latest and the most perfect the concentrated embodiment of knowledge, love, renunciation, catholicity and the desire to serve humanity so where is anyone to compare with him he must have been born in vain who cannot appreciate him so it seems to me that what vivekananda is emphasizing here what makes shri ram krishna the avatara varishta the greatest of avataras was his broadness and his ability to harmonize what seemed to be conflicting philosophies conflicting spiritual practices Sri Aurobindo I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Sri Aurobindo but uh in my own work I try to argue that Sri Aurobindo who is a kind of younger contemporary of Swami Vekananda he belongs to the same spiritual lineage as Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vekananda he was strongly influenced by the life and teachings of both of them and he claimed to have had mystical visions and communications with Sri Ramakrishna and with Swami Vekananda so that would be a topic of a different lecture but the reason I bring him up is because I think One particular statement Sri Aurobindo made in 1908 also helps us to understand in what sense Sri Ramakrishna was the avatar of Varishta. This is what Sri Aurobindo says about Sri Ramakrishna in an essay. He says, "Sri Ramakrishna was the last and greatest of all the avatars. For while others, other avatars felt God in a single or limited aspect, he, Sri Ramakrishna, felt God in his illimitable unity." as the sum of an illimitable variety he felt him in his illimitable unity as the sum of an illimitable variety if if any of you have read sri arobindo's works in english you'll know that he writes in this very dense victorian british victorian kind of prose but if you're able to get used to it there's a, a real beauty to it and a subtlety and philosophical depth to it that is really wonderful 
And so again, you'll find Sri Aurobindo also explaining that you know, why was Sri Ramakrishna the greatest of incarnations? Because he experienced God in so many different forms, so many different aspects. He realized them all as true. And what's important here is this was not a, an intellectual hypothesis. He was not a kind of uh, an academic philosopher uh, presenting a hypothesis that God might be this and that. He directly realized God in many different forms and aspects. He directly practiced many different Hindu practices. He, he practiced the disciplines of Christianity and Islam, and he realized that the same God manifests in different forms and aspects to different devotees and spiritual aspirants. So this mantra, and especially this phrase, this avatar of Arishta, Sri Ramakrishna, the greatest of avatars, because of this deep harmonizing impulse. This provides, I think, a segue to, uh, Dhyana Yogananda was laughing about it, but to my cryptic title, Sri Ramakrishna, the both and avatara. What do I mean by that? Um, let me start slowly. What I think Sri Ramakrishna found, this is in, you know, he was born in 1836, left his body in 1886. So this is mid to late 19th century. What he found in Kolkata, in his surroundings, is that most religious people tended to think in terms of what I would call an either-or logic when it came to spiritual and religious matters. The tendency was, and I'm talking about people who came to visit him, people he spoke to, when he attended lectures, this is the, the tendency I think he saw. This is my own language, this either-or logic, but I think that, let me explain it, and then I think that um, hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying. What he found is that most, most people would tend to say something like this. They tend to th think like this. Either God is personal, or God is impersonal. Either God is with form, and if God is with form, then a particular form. He has to be the form of Jesus, or, 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 or Shiva, or Kali. Or God is without form. Either God is Christ, or God is Allah, or God is Rama, or God is Krishna, or God is Kali, or God is Ganesha, or God, either or, either or. This was rampant during his time, but not just during his time. I mean, if you look at the history of religions, you'll find that this is a tendency among religious practitioners, and even theologians in different traditions. And it's also true about spiritual practice. <clears throat> Within the Hindu fold, Different traditions of Hinduism claim that a particular yoga, yoga in this sense means, it just means a spiritual practice. One particular type of spiritual practice is the highest. It's greater than all the others. So either bhakti yoga is the highest, or jnana yoga is the highest, or raja yoga is the highest, or karma yoga. Again, either or, either or, either or. Either one is a bhakta, or one is a jnani, either one is a raja yogi, or one is a karmi, karma yogi. Now, in February 1882, M. Mohandanath Gupta, the author of the Kathamrita, which is translated by Nikolanji as the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, on his second visit to Sri Ramakrishna, so keep in mind, M. was highly educated, studied Western philosophy and many other subjects. He had, I think, two or three master's degrees. So he was also educated into this kind of either-or kind of logic. And there's a beautiful passage during a second visit. This is, again, February 1882, which captures that. Sri Ramakrishna says, he asks M, well, do you believe in God with form or without form? It's a very leading question. M, rather surprised, said to himself, how can one believe in God without form when one believes in God with form? And if one believes in God without form, how can one believe that God has a form? Can these two contradictory ideas be true at the same time? Can a white liquid like milk be black? M, so this is just as he's thinking to himself. Then M says to Sri Ramakrishna, Sir, I like to think of God as formless. Then Sri Ramakrishna says, very good. It is enough to have faith in either aspect. You believe in God without form? That is quite all right. But never for a moment think that this alone is true and all else false. Remember that God with form is just as true as God without form. But hold fast to your own conviction. And then M writes, the assertion that both are equally true amazed M. He had never learned this from his books. 
So I think this is a very pregnant passage because it, it, it contrasts the, what I would call the either or logic of M, this sort of highly educated um, visitor of Sri Ramakrishna. And Sri Ramakrishna is both and logic, what I'm calling is both and logic. M is thinking, well, how can, if God is with form, then how can God also be without form? And if God is without form, how can he be with form at the same time? How can two contradictory ideas be true at the same time? And he had studied Western philosophy, so I think he might have been thinking of what, what Aristotle had codified as the law of non-contradiction, which is pervasive in Western thinking. I'll quote Aristotle's, one of his most famous definitions of this, or formulations of the law of non-contradiction. This, ta this is taken from his book called Metaphysics. Aristotle says, it is impossible for the same thing to belong and not to belong at the same time to the same thing and in the same respect. It's technical, so I'll read it again. It is impossible for the same thing, so an attribute of some sort, whether with form, without form, anything like that. It is impossible for the same thing to belong and not to belong at the same time to the same thing and in the same respect. The reason why I think M had this in mind is because Aristotle uses analogies like M's. Remember M's analogy. If milk is white, it can't at the same time be black, right? If God is with form, how can it at the same time be without form? So he's, he's subscribing to Aristotle's law of non-contradiction, and on that basis, he says that it just doesn't make sense for both of them to be true at the same time. But in Sri Ramakrishna's response, he directly says, no, this either-or logic itself is wrong. It's, it's possible that God can be both with form and without form. And this is what stuns M, right? And this is, I think, what is most unique, arguably, about the Ramakrishna incarnation. And that's why I called the title of this lecture the both and, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, the both and avatara. This is what I think is the most unique feature of the Ramakrishna incarnation. He was the both and avatara. And I want to explore this both and logic of Sri Ramakrishna in a bit more detail today in the brief time that I have by exploring six key questions which have been posed across the world's religious traditions for millennia. And you'll find that the questions themselves are posed from a kind of either or standpoint. And then we'll see how, I'll briefly discuss how some uh, you know, uh, religious traditions have, have answered these questions. Then I'll, get, I'll try to go in a little bit more depth uh, to explain how Sri Ramakrishna answers these questions using this completely different radical logic, the both and kind of logic. First question, so six questions is the first one, I hope I'll get to all of them. First question, is God personal or impersonal? Notice the either or logic at work here. It's either one or the other, but it can't be both, right? Is God personal or is God impersonal? All the Abrahamic religions, in their orthodox forms at least, hold that God is only personal. So Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. I say in their orthodox forms because, as, as many of you might know, there are some unorthodox Muslims and Christians, for instance, some great mystics. Mansur al-Hallaj, he famously said, An al-Haq, I am God. And he was killed for it, unfortunately. Meister Eckhart in the Christian tradition was a great Christian mystic who also uh, uh, made certain statements which seemed to kind of transcend an either-or logic. He also is not uh, considered to be an orthodox Christian. But in the orthodox forms, Abrahamic religions tend to answer the question, by saying God is only personal. And because God is personal, God cannot be impersonal, either or logic. But what about within Hinduism? Uh, I want to focus specifically on the tradition of Vedanta. One thing that I think a lot of people, even devotees, even monks get confused about, or that they have a misunderstanding about, they sometimes think that Vedanta is a monolithic tradition, and it's not. It's a plural tradition. There are many different schools of Vedanta, each one holding very, very different beliefs and doctrines. So let me just mention a few of them. The most prominent one is Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, the school of non-dualism. So according to Shankara's school, Brahman is only nirguna, which means impersonal, without attributes. And ultimately, so he accepted the personal God, but, uh, but he placed the personal God on a kind of lower footing, and he said that 
the personal God is true only so long as we're ignorant of the highest reality, which is Nirguna Brahman. This is Shankara's view. But there are other schools of Vedanta also, which hold the exact opposite view, namely Ramanuja's Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, qualified non-dualism, and Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta. Both of these thinkers and their followers hold that the ultimate reality, Brahman, is only personal, saguna, the exact opposite of Shankara. And they don't accept the reality of Nirguna Brahman at all. Forget about Nirguna Brahman, it's not a reality. But there are two schools of Vedanta which begin to adopt the kind of both and logic that Sri Ramakrishna preached in the 19th century. And these are lesser known schools of Vedanta because if you study Swami Vivekananda, you'll find he often emphasizes these three schools, Dvaita, Vishta, Dvaita, Advaita, but not these other two schools. So I want to highlight them a little bit here. Vallabha's Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta and Chaitanya's Achinta Bheda Veda Vedanta. These are two Vaishnava schools of Vedanta, both of which adopt a kind of both and logic to a certain extent. I'll explain that now. What they hold is that Krishna, Bhagavan Krishna, is the supreme personal God, but they don't deny the reality of Nirguna Brahman. They say that Nirguna Brahman, the impersonal Brahman, is a minor aspect of Krishna. But it's real, it's fully real. Nirguna Brahman is fully real, but a minor aspect of Krishna who is the ultimate reality. So the language, for instance, that, that Vallabha uses, it's a kind of metaphor. He says that he describes the non-dual Brahman as the charanam in Sanskrit, the, the, the foot of Krishna. You can see how it's a kind of minor aspect. But their both end logic has a certain limit because you'll notice, even from the language used to describe Brahman, that their both and logic is hierarchical. They place Krishna on a higher footing than Nirguna Brahman, right? Both the personal God and the impersonal Brahman are fully real. That's where they make an advance philosophically from Ramanuja and Madhva and Shankara. But they hold that, they don't, they don't believe that Nirguna Brahman is as valuable to realize as the personal God. So there's still a kind of uh, difference in the evaluation of Nirguna Brahman and the personal God. So this is where Sri Ramakrishna steps in because he takes the both end logic of Vallabha school, of Shuddha Dvaita and Chaitanya school of Achinta Bheda Bheda Vedanta one step further. By teaching that, by teaching, embracing and teaching a both end logic without any kind of hierarchy. That's what I see as very unique in Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. He says, both the personal God and the impersonal Brahman are equally real, but not just that, they're equally valuable. And whether you realize Brahman as the impersonal, non-dual, pure consciousness, or as some form of the personal God, that's not a matter of higher or lower, it's a matter of temperament. And the way he would explain this is with this beautiful metaphor, he says that some people like to eat sugar, while other people like to become sugar. It's a matter of temperament. There's no higher or lower there. I'll get to that in a little, a little bit more detail in, uh, in my discussion of a different kind of question, but I wanted to flag that now. And how did Sri Ramakrishna arrive at this really broad, non-hierarchical teaching about God as both personal and impersonal? Again, not as an intellectual hypothesis, but as a kind of spiritual scientist who ran, conducted experiments, and then found that the same God manifests as both personal and impersonal, depending on what kind of spiritual practices you perform. And he had a really unique experience called Vigyana, which I've talked about a lot in my lectures and in my scholarly work, so I'm not gonna bore you with that in detail, but I just wanna quote one thing he said, which is that the Vigyani, after attaining the knowledge of the impersonal Brahman, then sees that Jini Nirgun Tini Shogun is the original Bangla. It means the Vigyani sees or realizes that the same divine reality which is impersonal is also personal. He has a simultaneous realization of both aspects of God on the basis of this experience of Vigyana. And he would often teach in Bangla, Brahma Shokti Abhed, which means that the impersonal Brahman and the dynamic Shakti or the personal God are equally real aspects of the same infinite divine reality. 
And he would illustrate this inseparability of the personal and the impersonal aspects of God with different uh, parables and analogies. And one of my favorites is this chameleon parable, which many of you are familiar with. If any of you have studied the gospel, you'll know this. He says that there's a chameleon on a tree. And one person comes up to the chameleon, sees that there's a beautiful green chameleon, comes back and tells her friends, I saw this beautiful chameleon, it's, it's green, it's a really nice green. And the friend says, oh, let me check it out. So the, the next friend goes, and by the time the friend gets there, the chameleon turns out to be not green, but red. Goes back to the first friend and says, why are you lying to me? The chameleon's red, not green. And it goes on like that. Imagine there are four or five friends and they're all fighting with each other because they all see the chameleon in different colors. Then who intervenes in this debate? One person who might be a kind of a nature activist or something, he sits up, he lives in the tree. 24 hours a day, he sees the chameleon in different colors. And he says, you guys are all right. So don't fight with each other because this is a chameleon and it's the nature of a chameleon to adopt different colors at different times. Sometimes it's colorless, sometimes red, sometimes green. Who is that person sitting under the tree? I think that represents Ramakrishna's Vigyani, the person who has realized God in multiple forms and aspects. Now, one, one question that might arise in this context is that the chameleon can't be red and green and colorless at the same time. So does that mean that God is at certain times personal and other times impersonal? No. Every story and every parable and every analogy that Sri Ramakrishna uses, but it's true of every great spiritual teacher, you, you can only push them so far. And you have to know what to take from it and what not to take from it. So this, it would be a mistake to think that God is just like a chameleon in the sense of being sometimes personal, sometimes impersonal. That's not the idea. How do we know that? Because the, one thing I find useful in studying the gospel is that putting side by side and analyzing side by side different parables and analogies that he uses to explain the same idea. So in this case, one, another parable that helps is the parable of the blind man, the blind man and the elephant. Because here notice that the, multi, that the different blind men are touching different parts of the elephant, but not at different times, at the same time. One person is touching at the tail, at the same time somebody else is touching the trunk, right, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, I, I, I like to think of these different parables as kind of mutually corrective. They, they, they correct each other and clarify exactly how far you should push the parables. At the same time, we shouldn't be misled into thinking that the blind man in the elephant parable teaches that God has parts, that you can split God into multiple parts in the way that an elephant has a, has a tail on one side and a trunk on the other. God is personal in one side and, you know. Again, that would be pushing the elephant parable too far. So again, the chameleon parable will correct for that mistake, right? So now, then the question is, how is Sri Ramakrishna's both-and logic possible? It's, it's one thing that, to, to, to see it as a very beautiful teaching, one that might have help us you know, move beyond religious conflicts, but how do we know it's true? So let me remind you of Aristotle's formulation of the law of non-contradiction. Where's the cup of water? water? Okay, it's right next to you. Oh, I see, here it is. Okay, it's not Aristotle's law of non-contradiction, once again, the third time. It is impossible for the same thing to belong and not to belong at the same time to the same thing, and notice the last phrase, and in the same respect. So I think the reason why Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna's both and logic does not violate Aristotle's law of non-contradiction is that it meets this last phrase, this last qualification, this last clause, in the same respect. He never says that God is personal and impersonal in the same respect. He says that God is personal in one respect or aspect, and God is impersonal in another aspect. Where does he say this? I'll give you one example. He says in the Gospel, when God is inactive, I call him Brahman. When she is create, or okay, let's use she because he usually refers to, thinks of God as Divine Mother. When God is inactive, I call her Brahman. When she is creating, preserving, and destroying the universe, then I call her Shakti. Notice that the two aspects or functions of God are different. He's distinguishing. God in its or her static aspect is Nirguna Brahman. God in her dynamic aspect, creative aspect, preserving aspect, destructive aspect, is the personal God, Shakti. You see? So in that way we find that he's not actually saying something blatantly contradictory because God is personal and impersonal in different respects, but at the same time. 
And then you might ask, well, okay, that's nice, but then, then another question arises, how can God be inactive and active at the same time? If I'm jogging, I'm not sitting in my room, you know, browsing through the internet. If I'm browsing through the internet, I'm not swimming, right? But no, what, what, so the thing is, Sri Ramakrishna's answer to this question is, God is omnipotent and God is omniscient. Especially omnipotence here is the important thing. And one of, another one of Sri Ramakrishna's favorite teachings is, everything is possible for God. And another one, never put a limit to God. Never think because I'm not capable of jogging and browsing the internet at the same time. Or nowadays with Apple Watches and stuff, maybe you can. But in any case, God is capable of doing things that we can't even fathom. He would often say, can you put 10 seers of milk in a one seer pot? This is an old unit of measurement. But the idea is pretty obvious, right? The one seer pot here is our, is our finite human mind. How can we possibly fathom the mind of an omniscient, omnipotent God? This is the basic idea. So I want to move on to the subsequent questions because I could go on just talking about this one. But second key question, is God with form or without form? And if God is with form, then what form is he? Again, notice the either or logic behind this question. If, and we already talked about this in, in that passage from the gospel, right? This is exactly what M's logic was. So in Judaism and Islam, God is formless. They don't believe in incarnations. They do, they do not believe that Christ came as an incarnation of God. What about Christianity? It's a little bit more complicated. God the Father is formless, but God also incarnated as Christ, Jesus, but only as Christ. And they add this. This is a very important part of the Christian creed, at least Orthodox Christianity. God incarnated once and only once, so they don't accept other incarnations. Again, Orthodox Christians. What about Hinduism? Hinduism is a, is a vast tradition, religion. There are some Hindus who say that God is Krishna, who has a beautiful blue form. Some, some think of Krishna as, with a black form. Others say that God is Vishnu, who, who has a different form. Shaktas think of God as Kali. Shaivites as Shiva. Uh, followers of Ganesha as Ganesha, the, the elephant, the half man, half elephant, Hanuman, Rama, the, the list goes on. During Sri Ramakrishna's time, there was a, a new Hindu reform movement called the Brahma Samaj, which anybody who has read the gospel will know about it, because many followers of the Brahma Samaj would come to visit him, including Brahmananda, Vivekananda, M. All these people actually at one point, they, they attended Brahma Samaj lectures and found it convincing. What was their ideology. They believed, for instance, that God is formless, no form. They, don't, they didn't believe in God with form, so they didn't believe in any idol worship. They didn't believe in incarnations, but they insisted that God was personal. So this is a very interesting position. Formless but personal God. This is also the position of Islam, actually, and Sikhism. But what does Sri Ramakrishna say? Again, the both-and logic. He says, why think in terms of this either-or logic in the first place? That's the mistake you're making. God is both with form and without form. And what is that form? Well, multiple forms. It's not just any one form. God is infinite and omniscient and omnipotent. So God is capable of manifesting to different people in different forms, depending on you know, what form I like to think of God and meditate on God as. That's the idea. Sri Ramakrishna used the example of an infinite ocean. This is a quotation from the Gospel. He says, Satchit Ananda is like an infinite ocean. Intense cold freezes the water into ice, which floats on the ocean in blocks of various forms. Likewise, through the cooling influence of bhakti, one sees forms of God in the ocean of the Absolute. These forms are meant for the bhaktas, the lovers of God, of the personal God. But when the sun of knowledge rises, Jnana Surya, Gyanshuju in Bangla, the ice melts. It becomes the same water it was before. Water above and water below. Everywhere nothing but water. But you may say that for certain devotees, God assumes eternal forms. Nitya Sakara in Bangla. There are places in the ocean where the ice does not melt at all. It assumes the form of quartz. So every sentence of this passage is extremely important from a philosophical standpoint. But the first thing I want to draw your attention to is that there's no contradiction between the liquid ocean and the different ice formations, right? It's just the same ocean forming into ice. In the same way, it's the same God, whether God is with form or without form. 
The formless God, represented by the, such, the infinite Satchitananda, lovingly manifests to different devotees in different forms, depending on what form of, law, of, of, of God that they love and, and that they worship. But, one might say, Sri Ramakrishna also says that with the rising of the sun of knowledge, these ice forms melt, which vindicates which school of Vedanta? Can anyone guess? Advaita Vedanta, right? With the rising of the sun of knowledge, when I actually know the absolute, what happens? All these forms of the personal God melt. So if Sri Ramakrishna's parable stopped there, this would be good evidence that he believed that Advaita Vedanta was the highest philosophy, but it doesn't stop there. So let me read to you again the remainder of the passage. But you may say that for certain devotees, God assumes eternal forms. There are places in the ocean where the ice does not melt at all. It assumes the form of force. This is where he throws a wrench into assuming that, oh, he's ultimately he thought Advaita is the highest. No, because he believed that according to certain schools of bhakti, devotional schools, like Christianity, like Islam, like many Hindu traditions, like Vaishnavism, that this personal form of God never dissolves. It's eternal. And bhaktas themselves, the devotees themselves, as souls, when they become liberated, are also eternal. And I'll get to it a little bit later. The goal for these bhaktas is to dwell in a heaven, in a higher loka, with the personal God for an eternity. And he says, that's perfectly true. You don't, that, that personal God doesn't ultimately dissolve into the impersonal absolute. Third question. Which of the world religions leads to salvation? The answer to this question, a lot depends on the answer to this question. Much of the violence and killing in the name of religion that's, that's been perpetrated in the course of the past few millennia is based on different answers to this question. Some people, terrorists, will say that Islam is the one world religion that leads to salvation. Christians will say that Christianity, and so on and so forth. Again, the either or logic. If Islam leads to salvation, then other religions don't. If Christianity leads to salvation, then other religions don't. Either or logic. I wanted to mention here something slightly technical because I think it helps us to make sense of what's going on. In theology, in recent theology and in the philosophy of religion, uh, a the an American theologian named Paul, uh, Alan Race, he distinguished three different paradigms for thinking about the relationship among the different world religions. Exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. And I just want to briefly explain what these are. Exclusivism is the view that only one religion leads to salvation, and all the other religions are, are false and don't lead to salvation. Okay, Many religious practitioners believe this, but not all. Other religious practitioners believe in either inclusivism or pluralism. What is religious inclusivism? This is the view that my religion is the highest and it leads to the highest form of salvation or it leads to salvation the most quickly. Other religions are not completely hopeless, but I put them on a lower footing. They're steps on the way to my religion. They are lower stages on the way to the highest religion represented by my religion. That's what's called religious inclusivism in a technical sense. So inclusivism in a, in a popular sense might mean, oh, I'm very broad, I accept everything. That's not the, the technical definition is my religion is the highest. Your religions are not hopeless, but they're lower than mine. What are some examples? Let me give you one example from the Western side and one from the Indian side. Catholicism on the Western side. I don't know how well versed you are in Catholicism, but in 1965, a very, very important document was produced from the Vatican in Latin called Nostra Etate, which means in our time. The whole document is explaining the relationship between Christianity and non-Christian religions. What is that relationship? For centuries, the position, the official position of the Catholic Church was exclusivism. Only Catholicism leads to salvation. Other religions, nope. But the position changes momentously in 1965. I'm gonna give you a direct quotation from this document. The Catholic Church rejects nothing which is true and holy in these religions, meaning non-Christian religions, but rather looks with sincere respect upon those ways of conduct and of life those rules and teachings, which, though differing in many particulars from what she holds and sets forth, she being Catholic, uh, Catholic Christianity, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth with a capital T, which enlightens all men. Notice this last phrase. Non-Christian religions often reflect a ray of that capital T truth, which means Catholic Christian truth, which enlightens all men. 
So notice the inclusivist, this is not fully, this is not as liberal as it could be because the idea is that the sun, you know, is Catholic Christianity. Other religions may reflect a ray of that sun, higher, lower, right? On the Indian side, I think a good example of an inclusivist tradition is Advaita Vedanta in modern forms. Shankara didn't talk about non-Hindu religions, so it wouldn't make sense to say that Shankara believed this. But many modern followers, who are examples like Sarvapali Radhakrishnan in the 20th century, TMP Mahadevan, I think, as well. Why? Because, as I said, Advaita, these modern Advaitins say that Advaita is the highest. Other religions are not wrong. They lead to salvation indirectly, but only Advaita Vedanta leads to salvation directly. How do they lead to salvation indirectly? Because they help purify our minds. They help us concentrate our minds so that we can ultimately qualify, we can become eligible to practice Advaita Vedanta, Jnana Yoga, the yoga of knowledge, and then alone we can attain salvation. Again, you find higher and lower. Theistic traditions, bhakti practices are put on a lower footing. They're not wrong or hopeless. But they're stepping stones toward the highest philosophy, which is Advaita Vedanta. Um, it would take me too far astray to go into this in detail, but in chapter three of my new book, Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism, Swami Vivekananda himself held an inclusivistic Advaitic view for a period of about nine months, between 1894 and mid-1895. Um, if, you're, if you're interested, you can look at that chapter. But he, 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 just after that nine-month period, he embraces a much broader position, which is more in line, I think, with Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. And in 1896, for instance, in a lecture called Sri Ramakrishna, it was one of the few lectures Swami Vivekananda gave, very personal lectures, about the greatness of Sri Ramakrishna, his life and teachings. And Vivekananda explicitly affirms there that each religion has the same saving power as the other. This is what's called, this is the third paradigm, religious pluralism. Notice the language. Every world religion, every major world religion has the same saving power as the other. There's no higher or lower here. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, they have the same saving power. This is what's called religious pluralism. And this is, I think, much more in line with what Sri Ramakrishna taught. You'll find Sri Ramakrishna teaching again and again. Jotomot Totopot is the most well-known of his teachings on the harmony of religions. As many fades, so many pads. But I prefer a different uh, teaching of his because I think it's, uh, it, it, it's more philosophically uh, expressive. My favorite teaching is Tini Ononto Poto Ononto in Bangla. And the English here is God is infinite and the paths to God are infinite. The reason why I like this teaching so much is because he explains why there are infinite paths to God. There are infinite paths to God because God himself or God herself is infinite. And if God is infinite, it stands to reason that there are so many different ingresses, paths to the same infinite divine reality. And he argues for this, again, as a spiritual scientist who actually realized God in different forms and aspects. He realized, so he basically, the basis of his teachings on the harmony of religions is that God is personal in one aspect and impersonal in another aspect. And by conceiving God as both impersonal and personal, he placed theistic and non-theistic religious paths on an equal footing. This is what most religious traditions have, have not been able to do. They either, like Advaita Vedanta will tend to put the impersonal above the personal. Bhakti traditions, devotional traditions, will tend to put the personal God over the impersonal Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna comes along and puts them on an equal footing by, say that God, by saying that God is equally personal and equally impersonal. So that seems to be the key to his broadness and the both and logic. So in answer to the question, which world religion leads to salvation? All of them. That's Sri Ramakrishna's both and answer to that question. Fourth question. So three more. I hope you'll bear with me. Which of the world religions is the true one? You might say, wait a minute, I thought we just covered that in the previous question, but no. These are two distinct questions, subtly different. Remember the previous question was, which of the world religions leads to salvation? And Sri Ramakrishna's both and answer was, all of the major world religions lead to salvation equally. Religious pluralism. But this question is, which of the world religions is the true one? So it's about truth rather than salvation. This is a slightly different question. And again, you'll find most people thinking in terms of an either or logic. Well, if Christianity is true, then other religions have to be false. 
If Hinduism is true, then non-Hindu religions have to be false, and so on and so forth. But what was Sri Ramakrishna's view? And here I want to address a common caricature of Sri Ramakrishna's position. I get this a lot. I just, just about a week ago, I got an email from somebody who said, it's obvious that, uh, or everybody knows that the Ramakrishna mission teaches that all religions are true. How can that be? Because different religions teach different things. And so I said in response, show me one place where Sri Ramakrishna says that. He never says that all religions are true. He says all religions are equally valid paths to the same goal of God realization. That's very significant. But what about, what is Sri Ramakrishna's answer to the question of which of the world religions is the true one? This is how I understand it. His response is, no religion has a monopoly on the truth. No religion is 100% true. But all of them have enough truth to serve as effective paths to the goal of God realization. Where does he say this? There's a beautiful analogy he uses of a watch. He says that everybody thinks her watch tells the exact time, the correct time. But nobody's watch tells exactly the correct time. Everybody's watch is off at least slightly. What, what is the watch here? Any world religion. So not even Hinduism, his own religion. No, no religion is 100% true. Every religion has some false doctrines. But then he adds, even so, even though the watch is not 100% accurate, nobody's watch is, it's good enough to get, the, to, get, to get the job done, which is, you know, I use the watch to get from this place X to place Y, to make, to make, uh, to make an appointment in time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is that? What's the analogy? The analogy is, even though no religion is 100% true, it's true enough to be an effective path to salvation. This seems to be his view. Two more questions. What is the nature of final salvation? This is one of these big questions in the philosophy of religion and in theology. It's called eschatology. There's an entire subfield within theology called eschatology. Speculation about the final state of things. And again, you'll find an either-or logic at work in this question and in answers to this question in different religious traditions. Most religious traditions assume that the final state of salvation is the same for everybody across the board. Either it's a state of kind of merging of your individuality and non-dual Brahman, which is the Advaita Vedantic answer. Sri Ramakrishna used to use the example of a salt doll, which goes to measure the depth of the ocean. But the moment it sets foot in the ocean, what happens? The salt doll melts. It becomes one. So there's no longer any individual anymore. This is one answer to the question of what is the nature of final salvation. Advaita Vedantins say, there's just Brahman. There's no coming and going. There's no heavens. That's all nonsense. There's just Brahman. And you realize your true nature is Brahman. But other religious traditions give exactly the opposite answer. They say that, no, there is a special higher state, which in Hindu traditions are called lokas, L-O-K-A, lokas. And different bhakti traditions have different lokas. So the Vaishnavas will say there's a Vraja loka, which is a, a loka, a, a higher realm, an eternal realm where you dwell with Krishna. And, and other traditions will say, no, 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 but it's not Krishna, it's Rama or this and that. And so there are, we have our own Ramakrishna loka in our tradition where you can dwell eternally with Ramakrishna, with Sri Ramakrishna. Muslims have this idea of, uh, I think it's called Jannah in, in uh, Arabic, uh, which is their idea of uh, uh, an Islamic heaven. Christians have their Christian heaven, right? Again, it's either or. Again, Sri Ramakrishna's answer to this question, what is the nature of final salvation, is again adopting this both and kind of answer. He says, why, why adopt this either or logic in the first place? Why can't we conceive of salvation as a many-roomed mansion. I'm speaking to you now in this particular lecture hall, but maybe somebody's using the bathroom over there, and maybe somebody is sleeping in, in the guest room uh, across the way there. Why can't salvation be like that? Why can't different individual souls who attain salvation enjoy God in different ways? Where does he say this? Let me read you a passage from the Gospel. Mohima Chakraborty was a householder devotee of Sri Ramakrishna who was a staunch follower of Advaita Vedanta. So his leanings were toward believing that the highest salvation is merging your individuality in non-dual Brahman. No question of a personal God, no question of an ultimate individual soul. It's from that context that he's asking this very interesting question. He says, I have a question to ask, sir. A bhakta needs nirvana sometime or other, doesn't he? What is nirvana here? Not Buddhist. He's thinking of the nirvana, the extinction 
of the individual ego, the individual soul in non-dual Brahman. So even those devotees of the personal God, that's not the highest state. They also have to eventually merge in Brahman, don't they? And then what, is it, what does Sri Ramakrishna say? He says, it cannot be said that bhaktas need nirvana. There is a state in which the eternal Krishna is with his eternal bhaktas. The Bangla here is nitto krishna tar nitto bhakta. Krishna is consciousness embodied and his abode also is consciousness embodied. Chinmoy sham, chinmoy dham. Krishna is eternal and the bhaktas also are eternal. Nitto krishna, nitto bhakta. The, the, so which means that individuality doesn't have to dissolve into non Brahman. It can for certain souls who want to do that, but why does, he says, not everybody has to become sugar. Again, coming back to the sugar analogy. Those who want to become sugar will become sugar. That's the Advaitic uh, uh, conception of salvation. Those who want to eat sugar will eat sugar eternally if they want to. And then there might be others who want to eat sugar for some time and then become sugar. That's fine too. Why think in terms of the either or logic in the first place? If I can be talking to you in one room and somebody else can be talking outside, why can't salvation be like that? God is, again, omnipotent, right? And finally, sixth question. Which of the four yogas, so now we're talking about the Hindu tradition because the Hindu tradition teaches different kinds of yoga in the sense of spiritual practice, spiritual disciplines. Which of the four yogas is the best or the most effective in leading to salvation? Another one of these perennial questions which different schools of Vedanta and different traditions within Hinduism answer in different ways. Again, using an either or logic, usually, typically. Usually these different schools of Vedanta say only one yoga is the direct path to liberation, moksha, salvation. Shankara's answer is jnana yoga, the yoga of knowledge. What do bhakti schools of Vedanta say? Exactly the opposite. Bhakti yoga is the only direct path to salvation. It's higher than jnana yoga. But notice that all of these different traditions of Hinduism tend to follow this either or logic. Either bhakti yoga, yoga is the highest or jnana yoga. But it can't be both. They can't both be equally effective. What was Sri Ramakrishna's view? What was Swami Vivekananda's view? They both taught that all four of the yogas are equally effective in leading to salvation. Sri Ramakrishna says, for instance, from the gospel, innumerable are the, way, are the ways that lead to God. There are the paths of jnana, of karma, and of bhakti. If you are sincere, you will attain God in the end, whichever path you follow. Vivekananda says something very similar, even more explicitly. He says, each one of our yogas is fitted to make man perfect, even without the help of the others, because they have all the same goal in view. The yogas of work, karma yoga, of wisdom, jnana yoga, and of devotion, bhakti yoga, are all capable of serving as direct and independent means for the attainment of moksha. It's a very controversial statement because there are many uh, scholars and m some monks also who try to interpret Swami Vivekananda as a classical Advaita Vedanta, a follower of Shankara, but this directly flouts Shankara's teaching, which is that only Jnana Yoga leads directly to salvation. But he clearly says that all four yogas uh, are fitted to mean, make man perfect, are direct paths to the same goal of salvation. And now, so the view is from the standpoint of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda tradition, again, both and. Each one of these four yogas can take us to the highest goal. There's no higher or lower. But nonetheless, it's, it's more fruitful spiritually and more beneficial to try to combine the four yogas to the best of our ability. That's why the emblem of the Ramakrishna mission, which I don't know if it's here, but in any case, I'm sure all of you are familiar with it. There's a beautiful cobra, yeah, uh, representing Raja Yoga, and then the wavy waters representing Karma Yoga. There's a, there's, a, there's a swan, which represents the Paramatman, the Supreme Soul. There's a lotus representing Bhakti Yoga. And there's a sun representing jnana yoga. And the ideal of our entire tradition, not just monks, but any follower of our tradition, is to try to combine the four yogas to the best of our ability. Why? Because each yoga cultivates a particular aspect of the human personality. Bhakti yoga cultivates the emotional aspect. Jnana yoga, the intellectual aspect, the reasoning or thinking aspect. Karma yoga, the dynamic aspect, the aspect of will. Raja yoga, the aspect of concentration, right? Men mental control. So the ideal is each one of us has different aspects. So why not try to use all of our energies and direct them toward God, toward God realization, toward spiritual life? So that's, that's uh, 
just to kind of sum things up, it seems to me that at the basis of much of the religious violence and conflict that, we're, that we continue to see throughout the world that's been going on for millennia is, if you, if you look at it from a philosophical standpoint, that the people who are committing violence in the name of religion tend to think in terms of an either-or logic. My God, whoever that God is, is the only true one. Therefore, everybody else is false. Therefore, I must destroy them unless they accept my God. This seems to be the logic. This was the greatness of Sri Ramakrishna because he said he denied that fundamental assumption and he said that we should embrace a both and logic. It'll make for a much more peaceful and a harmonious world. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? I think there's somebody up front. He, you have one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. So we have to use the mic because this is <coughs> Thank you for the wonderful speech. Thank I you. A question on, uh, I'm a follower of uh, Advaita Vedanta. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm under the impression that, you know, the impersonal God is like absolute infinity. Right? So. Mm -hmm. Personal God is obviously limited in time and space. Mm. How can we say both impersonal God and personal God are the same? Obviously, one is limited, other one is that. Mm. I, I didn't say it's the same, right? Where did I say it was the same? They're different aspects of the same divine reality. Okay. And there's no higher and lower. That's what I was saying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Can you say your name before? Yeah. What's, what's your name, for Shiva. Shiva. And I'm Vaskar. Vaskar. Um, uh, so one um, who um, follows one path is very, very straightforward. But um, mm. if we are told, it's almost like going to a station and asking which train leads to a particular place. And um, somebody answers, all these trains are right. to the same station. And um, kind of people get confused which path to take. And, mm. I, I, I guess it's based on somebody liking and disliking. I think that's it, exactly. Is that Vivekananda, he used to say, no human being is born into a religion. It's a really radical statement. He says, each person has a religion in the depths of his or her soul. And the first step in spiritual life is to, dis is to discover that sort of unique, individualized religion in, your, in the depths of your soul. Each one of us here has a different religion, custom made for us. You see what I mean? Yes. So the idea here is, it's through exposing yourself to multiple religious traditions that you're able to better understand what is that religion of your soul. You see, and you're right that there's a danger of kind of religious dilettantism. The religious dabbler who, you know, I dabble a little in Christianity, then I get a little tired, and so I go into Buddhism, and then I go Islam, and then, you're not going to make much progress. Sri used to say, it's like, if you're trying to dig for water, and you start digging, and then five minutes later, you go, ah, oh, I'm getting bored, let me go to a sunnier spot. And then you go, and you start digging, and you're never going to hit water. So what's the idea here? The idea is that remain firmly grounded in your particular religious tradition whether that's Hinduism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism, whatever it might be. And on that basis, you can freely learn from other religious traditions. That seems to be uh, the approach, I think, of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. Thank you. Thank you. Name? Prashant uh, Rajiv We are connected from my source. Hmm, great. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit, the last statement you made? You start off with a mentality, you start off with a commitment, a uh, conviction. Mm. You say, I'm going to go from this path. And then that's an either or sort of a start because you need to focus on a goal you mm. can have. And then there's a transition where you go into a goal and an act, mm. right? I'm not, I, I get what you said in those mm. six questions, mm. but there's a transition you need to make. In your mental makeup, mm. when you go from a state to another state. So, if I am, I'm a Sri Vaishnava, but I'm initiated in the Ramakrishna order. 
Um, but if you start that process, you start with Krishna and whatever it is, and then you transition into a more of a open state. That's mm. what you're what you're talking Correct. about. Correct. Yeah. Can you talk about that transition a bit? It's easy to say it's an either or, mm. or both and, mm. but practically. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, but I, I mean, you know, answering that question, it'll take different forms depending on the individual. But I imagine, look at some of the like passages from the gospel. There were great Vaishnavas who would come to him. What, would it, what was his approach? He would use the infinite ocean example and say, it's wonderful that you worship God as Krishna, but never for a moment say that God is only Krishna. You see? And then the ocean. Yes, God manifests as Krishna. That's wonderful. And that's your, ishta, that's your ishta devata. Your chosen deity. But do you expect everybody to have the same chosen deity? No. That means for another person, that same God will manifest as Shiva. Because Shiva is the chosen deity of somebody else. And now the thing is, there's another aspect to this, which is, you can, even the Vaishnava, who worships God, Krishna as the Ishta Devata, that person can deepen and broaden his or her own spiritual practice by thinking that, that's, that Krishna is an infinite God who can equally manifest as Kali or as Christ. That's the beauty of it. It makes God greater rather than lesser, right? That's one example, but there's so many. I mean, we can maybe talk later about other examples, but yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, name first. Oh, yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Jim. Uh, simple question, I think, maybe. Um, is Vedanta a religion? We're talking about other religions. Mm. And I was kind of, in, at least in my studies, mm. some people think it's more philosophy than religion. No, it's a great question. So look, I mean, again, I, mean, I think religion has gotten a bad name, frankly. And not without reason. Um, sometimes, you know, people in the name of religion do the worst possible things, and the people become embarrassed about aligning themselves with religion. But what does religion mean etymologically? Re means again, re. And ligio is a Latin word which comes from the same word as ligament, something that binds or connects. Rebinding. Rebinding what and what? Anything that rebinds, reconnects the soul with God is a religion. Which, interestingly, in a Hindu context, what, yo, what word in Sanskrit corresponds perfectly to the etymological meaning of religion? Yoga. yoga. It's just what yoga means, rebinding or binding. Right? So if you think of religion in that sense, and not in a pejorative sense or a kind of narrower sense, why can't Vedanta be a religion? And here, Vedanta itself, we have to disambiguate. Like Wikipedia disambiguates Michael Jackson. There are different Michael Jacksons. But there are also different, different understandings of uh, 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 of uh, Vedanta, right? But Vedanta here, I think, if we mean Ramakrishna Vivekananda Vedanta, hmm? it means... I, I, I blank, sorry. So what's the... Uh... Uh, is Vedanta a religion? Oh yeah, thank you. Vivekananda says that Vedanta is the universal religion. So there are kind of sectarian religions, narrower religions, and then there's a religion which is universal. And so he used that language himself frequently, right? So it might seem paradoxical, but if you understand religion in that etymological sense, then you can see how Vedanta can be the underlying basis of all the world religions. While at the same time, still being called a religion, but just religion in this universal sense, call it a philosophy or a theology if you want. I think it's immaterial, what you call it, but I think that there's an argument to be made for thinking of it as a universal religion, so long as you understand religion in its etymological sense as rebinding the soul with God. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, hi, I'm Kimo, and uh, I wanted to thank you, Swamiji, for your talk. Um, and I really appreciate your approach, sort of almost in a, kind of an academic sense, uh, strengthening your, your premise and your arguments with a lot of examples. Uh, would I be, for example, a question, would I be following your philosophical premise or your discussion if I were to say that there's a necessity in the polemics, it's necessary to have <coughs> polar opposites to coexist. In other words, um, it's necessary to have these two directly opposite uh, premises in order for one to exist in conjunction with the other. Does that make sense? In other words, we need to have uh, the ideas of personal and impersonal God. We need to have these concepts in order to validify one or the other. It's kind of like we need a yin for a yang. We mm. need to have you know, uh, evil to have good. Mm. Otherwise, there's no way to distinguish one from the other. 
um, in that sense, both are sort of the necessity for both to coexist. And a second quick question would be, does the Ramakrishna order of Vedanta society see Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna, as, say, the 10th avatar of, mm. of uh, uh, Vishnu? Right. Okay, yeah. So, um, the first question, are, are, they, are there different aspects of God necessary in the different views? I mean, I think the word necessary is... But it helps to set into relief the different aspects of God, right? So before Brahma Samaj or Sikhism came along, the idea of the formless but personal... Or before Islam came along, the idea of the formless but personal God may not have been as obvious to people. They may not even have entertained it as a possibility, for instance. So when a view comes emphasizing a certain aspect or highlighting a certain aspect of God... That's useful to, to people even outside the fold because then they realize, oh, wait a minute, there's a completely different way of thinking about God. And then the next step is to ask, well, which of these views of God is correct? Oh, maybe all of them. That's the both-and approach. So, so I think you're right, more or less. Second question is, do followers of Ramakrishna consider him to be like the 10th avatar of Vishnu? Uh, the, the, the thing is, there's a kind of traditional, there are many different stories in the Purana about different incarnations and what the, the ten incarnations story is one of them in the Purana but those are already I mean it would be difficult to kind of map Sri Ramakrishna onto one of those I think um, but that's not we, I, I think most Hindus are not that rigid I mean I think most Hindus just as you know Rishi Sunak you know he's now the new prime minister he, he, he swore on which scripture Bhagavad Gita yeah and the Bhagavad Gita, I think, gives a definitive statement on the avatar, the nature of the avatar. Yada yada hi dharmasya glani bhavati bharata abhyutthanam dharmasya tadatmanam sujamiham. Whenever, yada yada hi dharmasya, whenever dharma declines, and whenever adharma, unrighteousness, increases, then I, God, incarnate in human form. So it's not only ten times, you know. We, we, so it's any time. And so that's the way I would answer that question. Oh, very good. Thank mm. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sorry? Which verse that? Chapter 4, and I can bust it out, but it'll take a couple of seconds. Yeah, chapter 4, like verse 7 or 8? 7. 7. 4.7. Sri Ramakrishna used to say in the gospel that every sannyasi, no matter how austere he is, should carry a pocket copy of the Gita. And so I... I... <laughs> Sorry? Kids, so we used, mm. to, used to watch the yeah, Mahabharata in Hindi, um, and this this was uh, chanted in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the most famous shlokas from the Gita. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm thinking about maybe. Uh, What's your name? Sorry. Oh. What's your name? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Leon. Leon. Yeah. Instead of looking for a, a discussion about the form that God can um, be presented or about form. Can you put the mic closer to your mouth? Yeah. Some abstract substance that's definitely understanding the notion of God. It's above understanding of little creatures. So we, we adopt the God as a highest force that actually leading uh, everything that happened in the world, in nature. So it's not a polarity of forms, it's just substance that's above of understanding that we have having our limitation. I had a little trouble following the English there, I'm sorry. But, um, I, I, from what I understood, you're saying that it's not about, maybe the best way to think about it is not God manifesting in different forms, but I didn't quite get your alternative understanding about substance and then what? Well, instead of looking at the polarity of the forms... I, I'm not, I don't think I ever talked about polarities, but... I adopt the notion that God is an abstract substance. Okay. Which is uh, above... Abstract substance. Yeah. Yeah. Above our understanding. Mm. And above our ability to understand. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. And this is in theology called apophatic theology. It means that God... You can't say anything really true about God because it, God infinitely exceeds our comprehension. Um, my own view, and the opposite of that view is what's called cataphatic theology, which means that you can say things about God, which are true. 
God is omnipotent, God is omniscient. And it seems to me that what Ramakrishna does is he embraces both apophatic and cataphatic theology because he says that just because God is infinite and, and incomprehensible in some way, we can never fathom, we can never put a limit to God, that doesn't mean that God can't truly manifest in different forms to different devotees. Do you see what I mean? Uh, and so that's why I think that, that this infinite ocean analogy is so powerful because it's this, I think that's very much like what you're calling an infinite or abstract substance. It's the infinite ocean, li- liquid ocean. But that ocean actually forms into different ice formations, different forms of God under the cooling influence of bhakti, that cooling wind of bhakti. So I, I don't think Sri Ramakrishna's analogies are, are that different from the alternative model that you're providing, as far as I can tell. Thank you. So I gather that the God manifests as an avatar. Um, is that limited to faith or religion, or how are leaders different than maybe how, how do people perceive avatar as opposed to a leader? I, I'm not following the question, sorry. What, did you say favored, or what did you say? No, how do people realize it's an avatar? Is avatar oh, I see. restricted to the beliefs or faith, or could it be a movement, or... Is avatar a, a, in the context only of religion? I can explain. So what she says is, uh. Uh, the concept of avatar has to relate to a specific religion. Oh, I see, okay. Or mm. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, look, I mean, so far historically, it seems like, I mean, first of all, an avatar has to be born somewhere, right? I mean, it's, you can't be born, and I mean, maybe you could be, the same avatar could be born in, you know, Jerusalem and the U.S. and Australia. But so far, what's happened is they're born in particular places. Buddha was born in India, so was Krishna, now Ramakrishna, different parts of India, which have different traditions, and so he was born into a Vaishnava family, uh, you know, and then Christ, you know, uh, Jerusalem and whatever. So um, it's possible, but it's, the thing is, I mean, usually what happens is when God incarnates in human form, God will practice the form of religion that's prevalent in that culture or feels a need to reform it in some way. So Christ inherited Judaism. He was a Jew, but he felt that there's, there's a need to kind of push it further in a spiritual direction. So you have the famous Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. and um, So, yeah, I mean... There, they, all the past incarnations seem to have been grounded in a particular historical religious tradition. But some of the greatest, like Bhagavan Krishna and now more recently Bhagavan Sri Ramakrishna, they teach the equal validity of religions other than their own. And they even explain their own home religion in a way that's so broad as to encompass and embrace other world religions. That's how I would see it. I think he has another question. Yeah. Just to wait for the mic. So in Advaita Vedanta it says that it's a complete illusion of what we are seeing is the world which is the Maya and um, it's equal into being kind of uh, mm-hmm. analogy given by Godfather. So given that, you know, God himself is incarnating in this dream mm. and is, you know, approaching the humans. And uh, it implies that it's a not a dream, casual game. It's going to be a pretty serious game he has put everybody into. Is that your thought too? Or? I don't even accept the, the paradigm, I mean, as I've argued in many of my works. But So I, I don't think Sri Ramakrishna subscribed to it's a complete the philosophy. Paradigm. No, he, he said that that corresponds to the Gyanis philosophy. But he says, I am a Vigyani. And he says, and, and so he says, the Vigyani, instead of seeing this world as a dream, he sees it as a mansion of mirth. Because he sees nothing but God. That's the beauty of it. There's nothing but God in this world. And it's a real manifestation of God. Hmm. Convinced? I told you my background is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think he accepted God of others. Philosophy has the ultimate position. Om Pur Namadaf Pur Namidam Pur Nath Pur Namudachati 
ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ತತ್ಸತ್ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು